Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carol White, President and Executive Director at the Corning Museum of Glass, and I'm excited to welcome you to this very special members only edition of Connected by Glass. All of the staff at the museum remain deeply grateful for your support and dedication to our favorite medium. On this episode of Connected by Glass, two of our curators will share updates on their current projects. Our doors may be closed, but their work planning exhibitions, working on acquisitions, and developing interpretive strategies never stops. I know that they are excited to give you a sneak peek of what's coming next. I'm very pleased to introduce two of our curators, Susie Silbert, curator of post-war and contemporary glass, and Christopher Maxwell, curator of early modern glass. And finally, Carol Ann Fabian, our Director of Collections, will serve as our moderator. And with that, I will turn it over to Carol Ann to get us started. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Carol, and thank all of you very much for joining us here today. We're gonna to spend about an hour together talking about two different topics. We'll take questions from viewers after each section, and then again at the end, if time allows. Um, so please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation to get them into the queue. In order to ask a question uh, on your toolbar for this session, there's a little uh, symbol and it, it's two overlocking uh, talk bubbles with a question mark in them. Uh, if you click on that, you'll be able to type in uh, your question and I hope that you will. Um, so let's get going. Um, first, sorry. Susie, Susie Silbert is here to talk a little bit about New Glass Now and how exhibitions like it have evolved the field of contemporary art. As our members know, New Glass Now celebrated what was new and now in the field of contemporary glass. Susie, uh, your work on the exhibition hasn't really stopped. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why the museum acquired so many works from New Glass Now? Here's a nice collage showing us uh, an array of selection of the works that were in New Glass now. Susie? I'm here, sorry. <laughs> the mute, it gets you every time. Um, <laughs> Um, so what you're seeing right now is about half of the works that the museum um, acquired from the show. And uh, so I guess the first thing to say is that the museum did acquire really heavily from the exhibition. Um, we purchased about, um, uh, we were able to acquire and receive by donation about half of the works in the show. And the reason for doing that, I mean, I think it's really a testament to the museum as it is now, as it has been, and I think as it will be, um, building off of the legacy of the two previous New Glass shows, the one in 1959 and the one in 1979, um, out of which the museum acquired many works. The reason the museum did that in that time was so that we could um, we could make the make the museum in the image of glass workers, make the museum in the image of the concerns, the range of concerns of glass workers around the country and in the United States. And with this acquisition, we are trying to do that too. So we are trying to build the museum in the image of the many ways that uh, artists are artists and designers and others are working and thinking with glass today. And the idea for that is to be able to create a museum that see, that feels more representative to glass workers and to the many communities of folks that um, use our museum in all of its different formats. So um, that's the reason for, for the acquisition. Great, thank you. Um, maybe you can share a little bit about your thought process around certain objects, how they fit into the story of contemporary glass and possibly highlight a narrative the museum has had been missing in uh, other years? Yeah, so this is actually, answering this question is um, 
one of the hardest things that I, I get asked to do in the sense that we acquired um, around 50 of the 100 works from the show. And so narrowing it down to just a short story about one or two of them, you can see I couldn't do it. So I'm just going to take you through um, three works um, that represent a small sampling of the ways that this acquisition um, uh, shifts, opens, um, broadens our um, our collection. So the first piece is the one um, is Jill's, the one that you see called called Jill's there. So we um, can make it happen there. It's called Blow Harder, Alternative Lexicons for the Hot Shop. And it's the work of two educators and artists, Susie Peck, who teaches at Rochester Institute of Technology, and Karen Donnellan, who teaches at Alfred. And they are um, really leading voices um, and joined by many who have been very aware of the kind of language used in um, in hot glass studios and the way that it shapes the kind of um, the kinds of inclusivity, the kinds of ways that the kinds of work that gets made in glass and the kinds of conversations and the people that feel comfortable there. So this piece, um, many of you might remember from the show, it pre presents uh, three different way it takes on the um, sometimes gendered and sexualized language of the hot shop. Uh, so they're suggesting things. It's also very funny. They're suggesting things like instead of using the term blow partner, in their feminist rendition, they're saying maybe we should use the word doula um, to, <laughs> to, to really change the language. They're making it equal and opposite. And I think in their um, in this playful but very strongly feminist work, they are advocating for a place at the glass table, not just for um, women, but also for people of a diverse range of gender expressions and um, and identities. And I think that this work and others um, that treat these same ideas from New Glass Now are really important to highlight at this time and bring into the museum's collection. And I should say, keep on view. Um, so that's that's one. Here's another one. Uh, the next piece, the next pieces I'd like to highlight are by Kir Young Choi, who is in the UK, um, and is Korean, and these pieces, which I love, they're diminutive little vessels, highlight the continued role of craft and really exceptional, exquisite craftsmanship um, to the museum, to the field of glass, but they they also are talking about really like particularly glassy topics. So what Kiryong has done in these pieces is he's highlighted the um, the imperfections that come from casting glass against a plaster silica mold to get this shape of these um, these boxes, these very kind of architectural boxes. And when you cast glass directly against plaster silica, you get little bubbles, little gaps, and those can be seen as negatives. You know the same way that we can see any gaps in where we'd like to be as negatives. But instead of pretending that they're not there, what he is doing is he is uh, gilding them using the Japanese technique of kensuke so that it draws attention to, um, to these imperfections and by highlighting them makes this incredible um, constellation, these starry night skies. So all of those reasons are reasons that underline why um, I wanted to acquire this work and I think why the museum wanted to acquire this work. But it's also true that um, our looking at analyzing our collection and analyzing who is in our collection and who we'd like to be in our collection. Um, I noticed that our contemporary collection in particular, that's what I'm thinking about, is and was very light on um, Asian artists and particularly on Korean artists. And so um, I am glad to be able to bring this and other works into the collection, at least as a starting point and a broadening point into the future. Finally, um, and I know that I get excited about talking about glass, so I'm trying to keep, keep, it, um, keep it together. The last <laughs> work I wanted to, to highlight um, is the Chief Herdsman and his Cattle, um, designed by James Magagula for Nguenia Glass. He works at Nguenia Glass, which is in the Kingdom of Iswatini, formerly Swaziland in Africa. And this series of pieces, these um, cows with their incredible, um, their incredible 
and very detailed hides um, and the chief herdsmen are representative of cultural traditions, marriage traditions in Eswatini. And this work uh, does a couple of things. One, it allows us to expand our collection of design, which is, uh, which is an area that I have been desiring to grow the collection for a number of years. And it also introduces our first work um, designed and made by Black African and again broadens the scope of our collection and also as importantly Nguyenia glass is the most green glass studio that I am aware of in the world they do all recycled glass they do rainwater catchment they do solar and um and their work I think is a, a real leading example for the world of glass into ways to build a more sustainable future so that's that's some ideas around how you know those are those are the stories around um, just three pieces in this acquisition. But the acquis each piece I evaluate in a similar way, and I evaluate the totality of that work um, overall um, to think about what does it say for our collection. How does it how does it build on the collection that we have? How does it bridge to the collection we'd like to have? Um, and how does it create opportunities um, also for ourselves and for our viewers to engage with new work? Thanks, Susie. Thank I know that was really hard to pick only three. As you say, the acquisition is uh, large, diverse, um, and extraordinary by every measure. So um, we look forward to talking about that more. But one of the aspects I enjoyed most about New Glass Now, uh, the exhibition, was the opportunity to have so many contemporary artists from around the world visit the museum, view their work, and engage with us and many of our museum members on a new level. For many New Glass Now artists, it was their very first time seeing their work in a museum and working with a curator. So Susie, you worked with a hundred artists at once. <laughs> to put this show together. Can you talk about how the museum's direct engagement with artists help us further the field of contemporary glass more generally? Um, well, first I would like to say, to echo, uh, there are few things that um, were more have been more gratifying to me as a person and as a curator um, than seeing so many of the artists make their way to Corning for this opening. Um, the artists that are in the show, the uh, other artists in Glass, um, that was a really incredible thing. And to see so many people in um, in our broader communities, in the Chemung Valley, and other folks travel to come to this opening was really incredible. But to your question about what it was like to work with so many artists and what that does for the for advancing the field of contemporary Glass, I think that it works in a couple of different directions. One, I hope, um, I hope, but it would really be the artist that would speak to this. I hope that the process of working with me and working with everyone at our museum is one that helps, first of all, show that the artists are valued, um, that we care about the artists and their artwork, um, that it is professionalizing, that it gives them my experience working in many places and then coming to work at this museum is that the Corning Museum of Glass really upholds a high level of excellence in our um, treatment of uh, artists and our treatment of objects in our, you know, our collection staff, our, like our prep folks, our registrars, our um, conservators. I mean, these are some of the most skilled people that work in the field. So I think that that, um, I hope is it is is something that the artists take away um, and that that helps further the field by showing a heightened level of excellence or showing value. But I think um, really working with so many artists advances the field of contemporary glass because it educates us as the museum into what what the concerns of these artists and others that apply to have their work in the show um, are are thinking about what is um, valuable to them. What do what do they want to see? What how can we how can we work to um, advance advance their goals? Um, this museum made it a point all the way back in 1975 to be responsive to the um, various glass communities and to try to be representative 
of their work. And I think that this exhibition and this incredible opportunity of working on new glass um, has been a further advancement of that commitment. And it shows both for our museum, for any other museums that are working in glass or let's broaden it out and say object-based media or an artwork, um, it shows a range of possibility. And it shows, I hope, you know, we have some very established artists in this, um, in this group of objects and in the exhibition, but we also have people that are just starting out. So I hope that it shows that there is quality in so many places that we don't often see. That's wonderful. Thank you, Susie. Um, I know you've been working hard to reinstall the contemporary art and design galleries following the conclusion of New Glass Now. Um, all of you members, I hope, will be able to see some of this work and more on view later this summer. Um, I see that we have some questions. So, uh, Susie, I'm going to turn to some of those now. Um, and here's one from Elizabeth. Well, all the glass partitions going up, with all the glass partitions going up, how are you staying connected by glass in your everyday life? The partitions being, uh, being our... Being I think separate. in the larger environment, the partitions yeah. are separation, just distancing. Yes, well, I will tell you that I, um, <laughs> I miss... I, I miss being around, I really miss being around the objects. I really miss being around the makers. But the things that I've been trying to do the most in the last couple of weeks is um, really listening to artists, um, really uh, trying to hear what a range of artists are saying, what they're doing. Um, to be honest, I'm working really deeply on finishing the current issue of New Glass Review, so I feel a deep engagement with all of the artists that will be in that um, issue, and I am really working on uh, reinstalling the galleries, so I am feeling below the radar, pretty connected to a number of works, but I really look forward to getting to do more studio visits and, um, and more listening and learning. Yeah, um, I mean, we've been fortunate uh, to have so many online opportunities to interact with people, but I think we're all missing the uh, in-person uh, experience of working with an artist or visiting their studio, as you say, uh, certainly coming to the museum, and we are very, very hopeful to be reopening the museum soon, uh, depending on what uh, Governor Cuomo uh, puts forward in our timetable. Um, here's another question. Uh, New Glass Now was a massive undertaking. What part of your experience do you hope to use in your future projects? Huh. Um, it was a massive undertaking. I, I, I have so many things. I, I have so many things to take forward. I think the things that I am thinking about the most right now in terms of what to take forward well, here are, here are two. One, um, remembering what I just said before, which is that there's so much value in glass and in artwork coming from unexpected places and for people that don't necessarily have the same visibility. So I think there's nothing like New Glass Review to remind me of that every year and certainly in New Glass Now. Um, I am aware of that more and more. And I think the second thing that that was um, really powerful for me about New Glass Now was the way that it was um, very transparent about its curatorial process and about how we open submissions to the world and did outreach, could always do better outreach, um, but really tried to invite people to submit their work. And then, you know, it wasn't just me making those decisions. It was me and a range of people. And I I really value um, having gotten to work with other selectors to hear what they think and what they see and to put those ideas right into the galleries, right next, right next to the work so that you know who chose that work. Like very specifically, this is who chose that work in that moment. And you get to, um, in the labels, we got to see um, 
really the curator's voice. This is this is what they were seeing. You know, you can agree with it or disagree with it, but it's what they were seeing. And I think that those examples of um, transparency and process, um, those examples of elevating voices that aren't mine are, um, you know, those are great things. And I was very thrilled to be able to um, lean into those things and learn about them in New Glass Now, and I look forward to carrying that forward in the future. Um, one thing I uh, saw in, in your process, Susie, working forward, you mentioned the work with the other, your co-curators on this exhibition, but um, the dialogue that evolved with each of the artists, um, once even they were selected, uh, getting it from that original selection point to being installed, um, becomes very much about a nurturing relationship uh, and, and a learning relationship, as you say, both ways. Um, so it, it's kind of contrary to, you know, other curators who are working in the historical past who are dealing, you know, primarily with an object and their own interpretations um, or the interpretations inflected by other voices. But um, in your case, working with the artists and the co-curators, this was, uh, you know, had so much of a sense of community. Um, and I uh, applaud your effort in that in that regard, especially being that the collection and the artists chosen represent such a broad uh, global community. And I should just, can I jump in? Um, I should just say, you know, one thing that I haven't made clear, but I really feel, first of all, choosing, choosing, only not choosing everything for acquiring by the collection was one of the hardest things you know doing the actual work of choosing and doing the work it's not like i was like oh i like this i don't like that it's not um that's not actually what it's like to be a curator at least not in my experience um my personal taste I mean, obviously I own my personal taste and it filters through, but um, my personal taste is not the not the starting place and it's certainly not the ending place. It is, you know, I'm thinking about this holistic range. Um, and uh, I think as important as the, like, the works that I selected are also kind of the ones that I didn't, like I think of it as like it, it's, there are pieces that I miss every day you know, that are not in this acquisition, but I also think um, I, well, one, we couldn't, we couldn't, for many reasons, we couldn't take everything, for a million reasons, we couldn't take anything, everything, but by opening it up, it means that we, the Corning Museum of Glass, um, don't own, like, literally or figuratively, this material. We are opening up these artists and hopefully all the other ones that are worthy that aren't in this, for other museums, for other collectors, for this work to find other homes. And it has been very gratifying to me that very many of the works um, have found other homes in institutions or privately. And my goal in all of this, and I think our goal at the museum, isn't just to be thinking about what the field of contemporary glass looks like for us or in our place only, but really um, to shine a light for um, for what this field is and what it can be and help other people expand their notions of this material. I mean, it's right in our mission. So that's, um, to me, that's how this exhibition and the process of working with these artists um, and making these choices has been. Um, thank you. There's uh, many questions coming in right now, and I'm going to try to fit a few more in before we um, change over to the second half of the program. Um, this one is, what does it mean to an artist to have their work selected for New Glass Review each year? Well, they don't get selected every year, but on the years they get selected. <laughs> um, we're talking, we have been talking about the meaningfulness of these works in uh, museums, in um, having artists uh, placed in other places, but the New Glass Review is this continuity vehicle um, that carries its own import. Yeah, I mean, what it means to artists to be published in New Glass Review, I can give you what my sense is of the answer to that question, but again, it's the artists that, that would be the people that could really tell you. Um, for me, what it means to have, what it means to have your work, I can tell you what I think 
New Glass Review does each year. And what I think New Glass Review does each year is, first of all, it creates something physical that people can hold in their hands and they can see um, this is where glass is now. Um, these are voices, maybe these are some voices that we should pay attention to. It shows, um, it is continuity, it shows a sign of life, but more than that, it shows lives developing. And I think that makes it incumbent on the museum to make sure, and me, to make sure that the panel of people reviewing the artwork is, um, is attuned to a range of, of emerging voices and, and lives. Um, and uh, and I and I think it's incumbent on us also to in increase the work that's coming in. But New Glass Review, New Glass Review, I think you know it's a it's to get published in New Glass Review is um, a really important thing in people's career to say, look, my work is there and my work has been seen and it's acknowledged and I'm showing it to the rest of the world. I've had people tell me that they applied. Um, you know, for seven years and never got in and they got in and they keep the issue of New Glass Review next to their bed um, <laughs> every night, you know. Um, I think pe people want to be seen, you know, New Glass Review provides that in a really uh, high way, both the work that gets in and also the work that doesn't get in, you know, that goes like there are pieces that I am sure I've held in my hand and it's just because of reviewing it in the New Glass Review process. So thank um, you, Susie. There's one more question here, and I think it's actually for me, but I'll read it. It's from Hal Weiss. Uh, New Glass Now showcased many artists with whom American collectors are not familiar because our exposure is mainly to galleries and shows like SOFA, which is gallery based. Do you have any plans to expand our exposure to this fabulous universe of artists and artisans beyond CMOG? Um, I if that is about are we traveling New Glass now as a traveling exhibition, um, I am um, very happy to say we're in conversation with several institutions about that um, happy thing. Uh, not at liberty to say which museums those are, but um, obviously the uh, pandemic has uh, put everyone's scheduling and conversations a little bit um, off in terms of original timetables. So um, we do hope that, in fact, uh, museums can see their way and we with them to bring New Glass Now to other institutions. Um, but the second half of that, Susie, is do you have any plans to expand our exposure to this fabulous universe of artists, meaning contemporary artists and artisans beyond CMOG? And I think the work in New Glass Review certainly is that. Um, our traveling exhibition would, but even uh, individual works are uh, loaned and borrowed um, by many institutions uh, regularly. We only have a couple more minutes, but I didn't know if you want had anything to add to that, Susie. I will quit. First, hi, Hal. Thank you for being on this and asking questions. It's so exciting. I can't see you, but I am. I'm thinking of you. Thank you. Um, um, one thing that doesn't get seen, you know, never gets seen, but is important work that the museum is doing and that the curators, all of us are always doing, is serving as a resource for other institutions across the country and across the globe. So I know that that's something that I do a lot, you know, curators, I try to maintain a lot of good contacts all over the place. But, uh, you know, a lot of times people don't know where to look, um, how to think about glass. So I am and they, they reach out to me and I help them try and see that. And hopefully that translates into people other places seeing glass. Um, so maybe that's an answer. Um, anyway, I don't want to distract from what's coming next because it's so good. So uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Susie. And um, don't go away because <laughs> My guess is we're going to have more questions at the end. Um, and I've just lost my place here a little bit. Here we go. Um, so I wanted to segue now over to um, our curator of early modern glass, uh, Kit Maxwell, and um, give you a little prelude to talking about uh, his work. Um, we made the difficult decision to postpone the opening of our major uh, spring exhibition in Sparkling Company. It will open in May of 2021. That doesn't mean that the work has stopped, however, though, and um, the curator, Kix McKitt, is here with us to provide all of us with a sneak peek at the Sparkling exhibition ahead. Um, so, Kit, I hope you're here with us. Um, nice. <laughs> Hi, can you share with us a little bit um, about what's so special about this exhibition? 
Yeah, absolutely. I am here and also so is my neighbour who's taken this moment to fire up a lawnmower the size of my motor car just outside my window. So apologies if you can hear that. Hopefully it won't last long. But yes, there are um, there are many uh, exciting and special things about this exhibition, I think, and many firsts certainly for the museum and also for the study of glass in this period. And what we're really doing is stepping back from examining the kind of the functional aspects of glass at this time and taking a broader look at it in its uh, cultural context. So sure, we recognise that there were moments of innovation in glass manufacture, in British lead glass, for example, and in the production of plate glass during the 1700s. But we also present it as a witness to the age and to almost an embodiment of the values of the time. And, and to do that, we really had to look beyond our own collections, which predominantly tableware, actually. And we brought in, or we will be bringing in loans from museums on both sides of the continent, both sides of the Atlantic, um, that will help us to explore these kind of complex and nuanced stories. So we have costume, we have jewellery, we have scientific instruments. But there are two, I suppose, in particular elements that I think stand out as particularly uh, special. Um, one is the Northumberland House Glass Drawing Room, and I think we have a look at that uh, coming up. Um, this uh, is uh, an incredible feature and achievement um, of the exhibition. The Northumberland House Glass Drawing Room was designed by the famous British architect Robert Adam for the Duke and Duchess of Northumberland in 1775. And um, the most remarkable thing about it is that this entire room, this entire reception room, is panelled with uh, reversed sp reverse spangled red glass, uh, with green glass columns and enormous looking glasses that were imported from France. Now the room was demolished in the 1870s, the panels were preserved, they were crated up uh, and eventually found their way to the V&A in the 1950s. Some of them were restored and put on display in London and at the new uh, V&A Museum in Dundee. But we are borrowing the last remaining panelling from this room, from storage at the V&A. It's being conserved especially for the exhibition. And we're reuniting it with three of Robert Adams' original design drawings uh, for this room, which are coming from the Sir John Soames Museum in London. And then on top of that, we're also working on a virtual reality reconstruction of this room. So it was altered even before it was demolished. So visitors to the exhibition and indeed online for the first time in over 200 years will be able to experience this room um, as it was intended. And then the second really uh, wonderful addition to the exhibition is a portrait by the um, celebrated British artist Thomas Gainsborough um, of a young, young woman called Mary Little, which was taken just after her marriage at the age of 23 to a wealthy textile merchant. And Mary Little in the exhibition represents the elite. She represents the people who would have owned the objects that we will be, we will be showing, that you'll see on display. And this elite actually made up of little more than 5% of the population, which is something which is an impression you don't necessarily get when you visit a decorative arts museum. You kind of imagine that everyone lived this way, and it wasn't the case at all. So Mary Little stands in for the elite, but you know, wealth and status, I think, uh, and I think our director of education, Chris Westerman, would agree with me here, are two of the most overused and meaningless words uh, in museum interpretation. They're bandied around very readily, but often with no context, often with, um, often they're not explained. And so the notion of the elite and of this great wealth in Britain for 1700s, if unexplained, leaves a great elephant in the room. And Mary Little is helping us to kind of unpick that a bit in the exhibition. Great. Thank you, Kit. Um, I'm uh, particularly intrigued by the story that this leads us to, but um, it is common that in uh, many museums, decorative art museums among them, that uh, they are emblematic of elite culture, especially when it comes to historic material, uh, such as, as being presented here. Um, can you talk a little bit more about this aspect in terms of Britain in the 1700s and some of the narratives um, we're exploring in this exhibition? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the notion that Britain was in the 1700s entering an era of prosperity and economic diversification, I think begs the question, where is this wealth coming from? 
that enables this great flowering of, of decorative arts. And the fact is Britain's, um, the wealth of Britain's elite at this time, either directly or indirectly derived from an economy that was diversifying through aggressive international trade, through colonial expansion and through the exploitation of enslaved people, predominantly enslaved Africans. And so that's the kind of the historic overview, but it also, it, it's very easy to connect it to the, the collection when you kind of apply yourself to it. Um, it doesn't take much uncovering. So let's take, for example, the tableware, which makes up the mainstay of our, our own collection. Um, and this is a this slide you can see now is a, a sweetmeat pole, um, which was made for use in the dessert course of a dinner. And it's one of many new forms of tableware that characterized um, the dessert, which became a major feature of elite life in the 1700s and resulted directly, of course, from the increasing demand for and availability of sugar, uh, which came from plantation colonies predominantly in the West Indies and was produced by uh, enslaved Africans. So the British transported over three million um, Africans to the New World as slaves. And this tableware, as we're displaying it, displaying it in Sparkling Company, is really um, a monument to the, the labor and of these people and their exploitation. And the, the basic fact is it wouldn't exist without it. Um, and another moment, I suppose, of reflection we offer our, our visitors is in front of this toilet service. Um, this, uh, we're borrowing again from a, a private collection, and we invite the visitor to take, physically take a seat and look at their reflection in this mirror. And dressing table mirrors were a focal point of elite life. This is where elite women and sometimes men would begin their day, but they were not alone. And we also include in the exhibition um, a print by William Hogarth showing, it's a satirical print, showing a newly married countess at her toilette, surrounded by a whole coterie of people. There are men, there are a hairdresser, a musician, a chaplain, there are female friends. There are also two uh, African men servants. Uh, one is in fact just a, just a boy um, serving, serving refreshments. And the population of London in the late 1700s was about a million. And there were 10,000 Africans known to be living in the city at the time. So when we consider that the elite were more, you know, five, just 5% 5 of the population, enslaved Africans or Af indentured African servants were a familiar um, component of an aristocratic household. And so the idea is that we realize that there are many identities connected with an object like this, not just elite um, white women. The identities were by no means equal, but as Susie said, this, about, this is sort of a starting point for that realization um, and that, that conversation. And it's also, I suppose, important to recognize that these, the two um, male um, Af African servants in the, in the Hogarth print, they would have been very, very familiar with the contents um, of all these objects, how they were set out, how they were cared for. They would have been essentially the custodians. And that kind of brings in subsidiary discussions about gender identities that we explore elsewhere in the exhibition. The spark, the world of the sparkling was not just a female, female world. Not by a long shot. We, we, won't, t we won't tell all the tales right now, but... No. Um, the exhibition describes a connection between these beautiful objects and Britain's exploitation of enslaved Africans, very specific to this moment in history, as you've uh, described. Um, I believe we also have, though, in our collection, medallion portraits of prominent British abolitionists, which show some members of the society at that time were also attuned to these issues. That is, it's not just our retrospection on this aspect of the historical narrative, but also part of their modern world as well. Absolutely. I mean, there's no denying that this was, um, there was an awareness about the, the origins uh, and the, the morality of the origins of all these luxury goods, among them sugar, that were coming onto the market. Almost every center of elite culture, every city, that is to say, in Britain during this time, was a harbour town, had a port, London, Bristol, Liverpool, Glasgow. People were very much in tune with the origins of these products and goods. And if they weren't, then the merchants who sold them advertised 
uh, their goods, often using illustrations. So sugar merchants illustrated their trade cards with depictions of enslaved Africans harvesting sugar cane. And there was a, uh, there was a movement against this. Um, and much of it, in fact, if I can just segue into another parallel, much of this centered around the consumption of tea. Tea was a national drink in Britain already in the 1700s, and it was sweetened with sugar. So people protested the, 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 the use of enslaved labor and the production of sugar by refusing to take sugar with their tea. And we include in the exhibition a couple of tea caddies, which by themselves are fine, but not A-list objects. But the tea came from China, and the British um, were, and later the Americans were rather reluctant to pay the Chinese for tea in silver, which was the, the standard exchange that the Chinese expected. So instead, um, cultivated opium and illegally flooded China with, with opium and created, stimulated an opioid uh, crisis. So the Chinese would in fact pay the British and Americans in silver for opium, which the British and Americans could then use to purchase tea. And in examining uh, the Asian collection last year, we, we came across this mouthpiece for an opium pipe in China, which seemed like, a, um, like look, we, we had to include it in the exhibition. And, you know, when you talk about the relevance, the resonance of these themes in the 21st century, I think, you know, punitive trade deals with China and opioid crises are, are very much also of the moment. Very much. Um, I think we're trying to make it clear to our visitors in this exhibition that 250 years ago, this was their history too. And many of the issues that resonate in our society today stem from this period or at least have parallels with that time. Uh, these are really complex, uh, nuanced and challenging narratives. And quite early on, you realized that as a white British male, you need some help in representing these stories. Uh, and we embarked on a wonderful collaboration. And I'm wondering if you, you could tell us a little bit more about that. Absolutely, yeah, it was, uh, this has been for me, one of the most educational and mind expanding and galvanizing experiences of this exhibition process. And it's also resulted in a wonderful friendship um, with Cheney McKnight, who has an organization called Not Your Mama's History. And I would encourage you all to look her up. She has an Instagram site. She has many videos on YouTube. And she is an interpreter, a living historian and an activist. And she specializes in the everyday experiences of um, African-American women in the 18th, 19th century, so predominantly enslaved African-American women. And her role in this, this exhibition has been really to give a voice to the story of uh, enslaved Africans and African-Americans who brought this incredible wealth to Britain and its, its colonies and whose exploitation is so closely connected, as we've seen, to, to, the, to the objects, the very objects in our, um, in our collection. And it was also I mean, there, there is, there's a lot of emerging scholarship around um, slavery and the Atlantic world, but it's really important to me to work with someone who also had an affinity with objects. You could approach objects with these stories in mind and be very much in tune with interpretation in the museum context. Um, so, I mean, having somebody on the team who could help us, uh, I suppose, confidently and accurately and appropriately talk about slavery and enslaved people has really enabled us to achieve I think, all our goals of creating this, this tension in the exhibition. There, there are beautiful things. There are things that are, are the result of great innovations in science and technology. And um, there's a great appeal, visual appeal to it, but there is a tension. All this came at, a, at a, an enormous cost, but needed an expert, needed an, a voice to express. Absolutely. Um, we are extremely uh, grateful to Cheney and look forward to continuing our collaboration with her. Um, even though our exhibition has been delayed uh, by a year, which gives us even more time to probe these narratives, um, the publication associated with is out. Can you share a little bit about uh, the book in Sparkling Company? Firstly, that it feels so good to uh, have it off my desk. But <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> the work on this book began in 2017, so before the interpretation for the, for the exhibition got underway. And I was really keen to uh, make sense of 
the, the place of glass as a modern, expensive and prestigious material in the 1700s. So I called on colleagues um, in a variety of other areas of specialization within the 18th century. So portraiture, science, costume, dining, furniture even. And I asked them if the, if, if the materiality of glass ever crossed their minds, if it, if, if it resonated um, with them. How could we talk about glass from different perspectives to kind of um, bring it into the fold in the conversation about elite material culture at the time? And it's really, it doesn't typically feature in any discussions of, uh, of material goods in the 1700s, which is normally reserved for porcelain and furniture and lacquer and so forth. So amazingly, um, these, these, these colleagues were fascinated by the subject, said, yeah, give me, give me a few days, let me think about it, and we'll get back to you. And every single one of them came back and said, yes, we'd never thought of it like this before. So we have eight different chapters, each by a different author, coming at glass from a different perspective. And it's beautifully illustrated, a lot of new photography from our collection. And it builds on builds on the, the the scholarship that's been laid by people like Dwight Lamb, former director, who wrote a seminal work on the golden age of British glass. Um, it builds on that and offers again some more context to the material during this period. Um, looks like I'm into the questions here, and we have a couple for you, Kate. If you've got a few more minutes for us. Um, and some of it you've spoken to a little, but maybe we'll expand upon it. I do want to mention at this moment, however, that the book is released. It is available through CMOG uh, shops online, um, which we're shipping out and hope people will uh, prime themselves for the exhibition by uh, purchasing the book this year. Um, here's a question for you. Although the exhibition has been delayed, that doesn't mean your work is done. Don't we know it? <laughs> um, what one aspect of the exhibition that you're grateful to have a little extra time to work on? Well, well, <coughs> gosh, I don't think there is just one, but um, one one element of the exhibition that really captured my um, attention. I mean, there is a lot to still refine, and and there is a lot that we can uh, incorporate in response to you, to you, the current events, obviously. Um, and I'm thrilled that Cheney is going to continue to be our partner in, with this extra year to help us really nail that. But I became particularly interested in uh, the British relationship with China during this period and the East India Company and um, the way in which it undertook business in China. And I, I'm not sure there's capacity to, to work this into the exhibition, but it's certainly something that I would like to incorporate into the programming or talks uh, around it. Um, it's, it's having spent a year working with um, uh, Shelley Tue, who joined us from Shanghai on the Asian collection, the, my appreciation for these connections has grown considerably since we yeah. began the interpretation of the exhibition. Yes, the, the interflow of that global uh, scene that, that uh, you're uh, describing in the exhibition. We have another question here from Jim Russell. Um, what was the what was more important, functionality or artistic beauty? I think that speaks to the crafting of the works that are in the show, from the mind of the artist at that time. That that's a question we uh, said I certainly address in in the book, and I try to touch on in the exhibition. I think the the glass, um, particularly British lead glass, is highly refractive. Um, it could be faceted. Um, to make it reflective, it was very, very polished and highly finished surface. That related, um, that really embodied the cultural values of the time. The notion of the polished and the polite were almost, well, they were interchangeable in the 1700s. And people often compared their manners to glass, um, to the, the ability to hide all um, imperfections and to just present to the world what the world wanted to see, to reflect the tone of um, the society they were in. So I think it's absolutely uh, both, that the two were inex inextricably uh, bound. Um, this was also the era of the, the diamond. This is when the diamond became the most prized precious stone. And of course, there are connect connections between the visual um, effects of the diamond and, and cut glass. 
But I think it still all stems back to this highly polished refract, refract, refractive uh, surface. So it's, it's a super interesting question. And yeah, it's one that I try to address in the book and several other authors touch on it too. Exactly. Um, so in Sparkling Company has, as you've mentioned, some spectacular loans from institutions around the world. Um, I don't I don't know that this could be answered, but the question says, what are you most excited to show at CMOG of the loans? Oh. <laughs> all your children are all your favorites. I know. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, um, I'm most excited. So we have costume coming in a man's a man's court coat with the, embroidered with glass, which um, isn't too unlike the one actually you can uh, on the front of, 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 the, of the book. But we also have a new acquisition. Um, which is a man's dress sword, which is encrusted with um, paste, gla glass paste stones um, that look like you know, sparkling like jewels, colored jewels and diamonds. And this, you know, the ultimate in, in male jewelry. And I quite like the notion personally of uh, exploring the sparkling surface as a, a masculine surface as, as well as a feminine. So I'm, I'm, it'll be the first time that this sword has been on display. So I'm, I'm very excited. Wonderful. And here comes another question. The The exhibition seems to focus on British glass. Indeed, is it in its title? Um, are there any examples of glass made in North America? Um, but I would broaden that out to say how you've addressed the connections between the Americas and Britain at this time. Yeah, bro broadly, I've considered America as part of Britain. Um, we don't have any glass that was made in America, um, that so the, the industrial development of America isn't something that we uh, explored, but America as part of the British Empire is. And so we do have glass that commemorates in uh, the American Wars of Independence, um, loyalist glass actually. Uh, and we do have a goblet that uh, commemorates the Hudson's Bay Company, which controlled much of modern day Canada, which still in fact, retains uh, the Queen, the British monarch, as its official head of state. So we kind of, we do address uh, America and glass, uh, the connection between the two, certainly. Yeah, it, it is, you know, for American audiences, um, it, helpfully in the book, and I believe in the exhibition, you know, the map that describes, visually describes the British Empire at that time, um, in this age of enormous colonialization and globalization, um, does make those connections between the Americas, but it's a little different than uh, an American audience looking at America. So it, it's a very, another one of the uh, you know, really interesting uh, stories that, sh that you will be telling in the exhibition. Um, I see there is one question here that, um, here's another one. Why do you elect to examine glass from this particular period of British history? That is also something that was really important. We all felt was important to address. This is an exhibition about glass in a museum of glass. So we needed to pinpoint this moment. And really it was the, the, the establishment of the, the British lead glass industry as being the dominant uh, glass industry in Europe. Um, so surpassing Venice and establishing, I mean, it was British like glass was developed in the earlier in the, in the 17th century, but it's really in the 18th century that it quashed the threat from Ireland by um, uh, inhibiting Irish glass houses from, from trading externally. Um, and this glass had a, glo a global network for trade. So it seemed this was the moment of British glass, but also there were great developments in plate glass manufacture, which transformed architecture through windows as well as interiors through the use of looking glasses and mirrors and um, scientific glass too, lenses, this, you know, the, the age of the enlightenment. So all these um, threads seem to really come together at the, the dawn of the long 18th century, let's say, so 1660 to 1820. Right, the, the dawn of the modern age, I think we talk about a little bit as well. Um, there is one question here that isn't for Susie or Kit, so I'll take it, and is a question about the museum and uh, the Carter Steuben collection, and if that is still uh, going to be available uh, to be seen, and of course it will. 
Uh, whenever we are able to reopen, Carter Stuben Gallery will be uh, among the many delights um, our visitors can take advantage of. Um, I'm going to wait a few minutes to see if there are um, other questions coming in, and I'm well, for Susie or for Carol White or for Kit. Uh, we have a few more minutes here. So I'll just take a pause to give you a chance. I see there is one comment, sort of a comment question. Um, from one of our colleagues. I'm trying to find it here. I saw it before. From Amy Schwartz at the studio at CMOG. About 20% of this is for Susie. About 20% of the artists in the show have been artists in residence at the studio at one point or another. Uh, many others have been students or instructors there. Would you like to talk a little bit about New Glass Now and its connection to the studio and the artists that uh, we welcome in that context? Yeah, well, I think um, I think one of the most exciting things about the Corning Museum of Glass in its totality is that it combines um, both the the museum, the collection of objects, the Reikau with its incredible um, holdings of resources on glass and the studio, which provides incredible high level um, education in glass and also professional development in glass um, for artists and um, artists to be of, of all different stripes. So um, one of the things that I personally find incredibly enriching, but beyond that, I think is a is um, is a real this is speaking. This is speaking as a human being, not as uh, the curator of post-war and contemporary glass at the museum. As a human <laughs> being, I, yes. Well, as a human being, I think that um, the residency program at the at the studio is an incredible gift to the field. Um, the idea that we are able not even the idea, the reality that we have for so many years or that Amy has and her staff um, have been able to create opportunities for artists to come to spend um, a month here to have the support and supplies to be able to advance their work is something that makes um, the field stronger. It is so hard to, it is so hard to make glass you guys. I mean, hopefully some of you listening know that already. My background is as a glass worker and holy cow, sometimes I think, I mean, sometimes my job is hard. I feel like my job is hard, but being a glass worker is harder um, for a variety of different reasons. So being able to have um, the studio as a place that people can come and learn, but as a place to be residents and then also for the museum itself to be able to, um, to me and my position, my predecessors, um, to be able to have that longer time, other people at the museum to have that longer time to interact with residents is um, is really huge. And I learn so much every time I get to go over to the studio and um, and meet with uh, artists and residents. And 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 like what I think is amazing is that as curators, it isn't just me. You know, I'm like an obvious choice. Okay, fine, meet with Susie. But it's actually um, many of the curators meet. Um, Marv Bolt um, is one of the who's our curator of science and technology is uh, probably way more popular with the artist than me, um, you know, because he has this great connection. So um, I think that connection with the studio and um, the exhibition and the collection and the field more broadly um, is, is, um, is again a testament to the incredible organization that is the Corning Museum of Glass in all of its three parts. Well, thank you, Susie. That's a great wrapper. Mm -hmm. um, speaking to our wonderful community, including all of our members who are with us today. Um, I think that's all the time we actually have together. So I'd like to thank our presenters, Carol White, Susie Silbert and Kit Maxwell. And to let you know that we'll be back with another episode of Connected by Glass on June 25th at one o'clock. 
and you'll have to look for more details on our social media soon. And there will be more members only events also that uh, you'll be hearing from our uh, advancement department on some of uh, those events. We're so delighted you were taking time to join us today and we hope to see you soon in person and in line. So please take care.